I'm doing this, this, this is a bit of a strange um, section that we've got here because it doesn't match what was in the book, but we couldn't match everything that was in the book anyway. So, um, so now this morning we heard a little bit about references to transport because that was part of the communication section in the original and it's sort of somewhat shameful that we didn't do anything big on transport. We just have one small little couple of pages on the best transport was no transport, well we can all do <laughs> that, it's jolly good, uh, but uh, that, that, was the, that was the end of it, there really wasn't very, very much more at all. Um, and it, it doesn't sit, so in those days we thought about communication, you know, because that was all part of what was thought of in the 19th century as communication, but communication has gone off into its own world now, and transport is something different. And that's much more like the nature of uh, cities, towns, settlements, how we live. And that's had a big influence on, on how we live. So um, uh, that, that's why we, we, we put all these things together. And I've got these very distinguished people here, some of who are also experts on transport. So we've got Herbie Girardi here, who um, is uh, well known for his work on cities. And unfortunately, he's got to rush off to the Chinese embassy this afternoon to collect his visa for going to Shanghai tomorrow. So he's in great demand. Uh, so, uh, okay, and then we've got Chaz Ball, um, who's uh, sort of missed the car club, so I think, or, 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 or someone who's done that. Um, but, but you will hear more about him. He's also um, remarked that we we are tw we are in Twitter. Uh, there's on definitely on the table there. Oh, it sits here. Yes, the Twitter hashtag. Yes. So he's he's not as old as he looks. So a Twitter account. Right, okay, thank you. Thank you, that's very good. And then we have uh, Hugh Barton here, who is a sort of local lad, um, <laughs> but, uh, has been working at the University of West of England. He, he, is, he is a genuine uh, academic clown. Um, uh, yes, completely ivory tower. Yeah, well, <laughs> but the founder of uh, CAT's urban um, offshoot called the Urban Centre for Appropriate Technology. Uh, here in Bristol many years ago. So, uh, a distinguished panel. And then there's Ian, who's the empty chair. Uh, okay, so uh, I think what was interesting about the, the lack of, of work, about the, uh, the treatment of, of transport was that we thought that cities were wicked. I think that's what it is in there. There was a very strong Arcadian bias. Of course, we thought the cars were wicked as well. Um, but and, and that sort of wickedness in a sense has continued or that ambivalence about it has continued we've seen this morning uh, this general idea that, that there are these technological ideas they develop and sometimes they look very promising and go off in a radical direction but also you have a, a similar countervailing uh, dystopian trend as well and they often tend to cancel each other out and that's why and one of the things here is up, we're asking the question, well, is progress an illusion, actually? I mean, is it just simply that things just change, but they don't actually get any better? Because any of the improvements are cancelled out by, uh, by some bad things that are happening as well. So we are just sort of going round and round circles in, in a slightly different way. But we're also looking for genuine nuggets. I mean, things like, yes, we'll keep that one. That's a good, we can do something with that one. So we're always looking out for these neat little things. So, uh, I think it's fair to say that back in those days, uh, we had a very strong, uh, what you're saying, like an Arcadian bias. And you see that if you go and look through the, uh, the exhibition and you see all that stuff, and you see the imagery and radical technology, it's an Arcadian bias. We're all thinking, well, we're all going to be in the countryside, it's all going to be lovely, and we'll all be jolly peasants and nouveau pauvres. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll all have a, have a nice time in that thing. And that, it's partly expressed here in, in one of the frames from uh, uh, Cliff Harper's Class War Comics, uh, where they're here they're having an argument about uh, that. Incidentally, this... this very image sat in opposite the loo uh, in the toilet at CAT for many, many years. <laughs> There's people in the audience laughing, uh, sitting there. And it, it used to make people grind their teeth, you see. Some people, sat there, some people sat there going, yes, you know, and other people said, how dare they tell me, you know, what it's about. And so it, it caused a lot of eruption and eventually it came to a, a great big meeting and there was, you know, we almost came to blows over it and finally it was removed <laughs> as being a, too provocative. But anyway, uh, so here we are. Uh, we've got everything here that makes life free and happy, but you also dissatisfied. 
Um, now, that's, that's a, I think that's a very important um, thing that's also arisen from this morning, uh, the question that over the whole conference is that can we do it in a little bit? Can we do radical technology and all the nice things that we want to do? Can we do them in a separate bit and have all the benefits and get on? Meanwhile, the rest of society goes on its own sweet way. Uh, can we just ignore them? Or are we doomed eventually to just get swallowed up and swamped by the whole thing? Can you do it in a little bit? I think that's a, that's that, and, and there were several uh, matters in the audience that came out to that. So, okay, so the Arcadian bit, um, I, I think it's very interesting. Uh, the, it was very influenced, I think, by a long tradition of Arcadian writing in Britain, notably William Morris's News from Nowhere, um, which is a wonderful novel, great read, and it was written in reaction to another novel, an American novel, which we've got a copy of out there in the exhibition, called uh, Looking Backward. And Looking Backward was a much more sort of conventionally socialistic, um, sort of rather a sort of industrial vision about the future, and William Morris hated it. He didn't like it like that. He wanted it to be really simple and rustic and rural, and so he wrote News From Nowhere, you know, which is very charming. And in those days, I think we were all Morrisians, you know, we said, yes. <laughs> William Morris. Uh, now, as we've all got older, I think quite a lot of us uh, are reluctantly become Belavians. You know? uh, we, we, because we've understood that you cannot deliver William Morris's vision to everybody. It's only for an elite. And so, you know, there's, there's a contradiction there between us, so Arcadian sentiments and also our sort of socialistic feeling that this stuff should be spread around and we should, we should have the benefits. For everything. So that's that's a, a quite important notion. I think we've we've sort of reconciled ourselves to the fact that there are going to be uh, these uh, rather high tech industrial processes going on inevitably, and in particular, we've reconciled ourselves to cities. Yeah, we don't think that the future is a is a, is a rural one anymore. It's an urban one. That's 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 inevitable. And now we've also discovered that cities are actually more. Um, uh, more rational and more efficient because of the short distances and the high densities and we can we can serve everybody very easily uh, much much better than in scattered rural areas but the interesting thing about the scattered rural areas I'll come to, back to this a bit was the idea of autonomy that you could actually build a little homestead and you could run it with all its own services using all the ambient flows of energy and materials and you could do that. That was an interesting dream to have and we followed it and, and the, well, the rest is not very good history. But um, what's interesting about the whole thing is that we did believe not in uh, autonomy in the sense of uh, individualism but some kind of uh, good collectivism and that came up this morning, Tony was talking about it, other people were talking about it. it's really uh, collectivism so the notion of autonomy comes out in uh, something that we can share among people like us. That's essentially what it is. And again, that came from the floor. What Sue was saying, what do you mean? There's people like us. Um, well, we surely, everybody's got to have this. Um, autonomy becomes awkward and difficult when it's not people like us. We can, we can manage it with people like us. So that, that, there's, there's a, a key uh, factor there that we need to take into account. Um, could I have another slide? Um, we retain, uh, just, just click it and it should go on with it. Um, we, we reconciled ourselves to cities. Does it go down? I, I know, the previous one, that's it. Um, the cities, but uh, not to cars. And this is an interesting thing, and I hope uh, Chad's is going to follow up on this. Sorry, you can't see this very well because of the lights. Uh, could um, get to yeah, well, okay. You can you, you can get down. What? Down the lights. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, this is in the exhibition. Uh, these are the whole series of uh, pictures by the Swiss uh, painter uh, Jörg Müller. Um, and uh, this is the, there's the two series. One's urban, one's rural. This is the urban one. So it's a little bit uh, dark, but uh, you can see this is his image of a sort of idealised city in, say, 1953 or something like that. And through the whole se sequence, winding the clock forward every three years or so, he eventually ends up uh, in the late 70s with this. 
Uh, and uh, it's utterly plausible because we've all sort of, for those of our generation, we've seen it happen. And what's interesting is that you could look at that and you could say, well, 53, could be 43, could be 23. It's not a big change that's happened. You look at this and you could say, well, that's okay, that's 1980 or something. Could be 1990, could be 90. See what I mean? Uh, this represents the modern city. We, we just, we know that. And that represents something we've sort of lost, the old way of doing things. Um, it's as if in one generation, the whole thing transforms. The whole city just transforms itself into something completely different, not very convivial, uh, but more efficient at dealing, you know, at all these commercial operations that you see here. That's very good. And more efficient for motor vehicles. It's mostly designed for, to maximize motor vehicles, and everybody voted with their feet or with their wheels. For, for that, that was that was something that sort of everybody seemed to want, and was very popular, and and we, we sacrificed the cities to the to the motor car in this way. Now, uh, that's something I think we still have a lot to say about. That we don't need to do that. I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's too late in many ways. But uh, we can we can look at that in a completely different way. Um, okay, so um, let let me um, go on to the next one. Um, uh, the section that I wrote uh, was called autonomy, uh, and I tried to e examine all the different uh, aspects of it, particularly uh, autonomous single-dwelling autonomous houses, looking at all the, uh, the possibilities, and uh, I drew very hev heavily on the work of Robert and Brenda Vale, who sadly can't be with us. Brenda is, is Professor of Architecture at the University of Auckland, and they live in New Zealand, and uh, they are coming to Britain later this month, but <laughs> I couldn't quite make it here, but we're very sorry about that. But they did send a PowerPoint presentation, which we are going to show, uh, and it'll be on a kind of continuous loop, and you'll be able to see what they, what they think about, about some of these aspects. Um, I think it's very clear that <coughs> some of their early experiments in autonomy were remarkably successful. They did manage to crack it in lots of ways. Um, which was quite interesting. Um, and they even did a joint PhD on, on self-sufficiency. Probably, the, I don't know, perhaps there's other people that but isn't that interesting? That together they did a joint PhD. They actually went so far as buying a house, or it was a pub, actually, and then they developed the whole thing and they recorded everything and wrote it all up as uh, their PhD at the University of Cambridge. Very interesting. Um, at the end of it all, uh, I said to Robert, um, well, you know, what, what's the bottom line? Is self-sufficiency really possible? And he said, well, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, you can get pretty close, but you need to have a damn good job in able to be able to afford it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, because you need a lot of kit and stuff like that. And that's one of the problems. The autonomy thing, you need a lot of kit. Because when you sacrifice shared goods and shared economies of scale, you need a lot of stuff to do it all yourself. You can do it if you want to, but uh, the economic pressures suggest that's not a good idea, and also in terms of resource use and so on, reticulation, connectedness, networks are really the key factor. Um, and also, I think probably we need to look at what we're going to share and what we're not going to share. And here's an interesting one. This is uh, possibly the most famous uh, image from Radical Technology of the Vision series. Um, which was worked out by myself and Cliff Harper. I mean, you know, we've got some fantastic uh, uh, correspondence about this, you know, the toing and fro. You know, he wanted to do something more artistic, and he wanted to do something more geeky. You know, but uh, gradually, uh, this is what he produced, which is really interesting. Uh, so here you have uh, a, a terrace, and you can imagine lot of families living in the terrace, but, hmm, interesting, are they families? What is it that's living in there? Is it a so-called commune? Uh, is it um, so people in those days nowadays used to go around with badges saying nuclear family no thanks <laughs> uh, yes uh, yes okay um, because they didn't believe in the nuclear family um, and so things would be shared okay you could share you could have a bakery there that's just like Victorian times uh, you could have a laundry that's good in Victorian times again for a, for a group of houses you wouldn't share toilets, for God's sake, in the showers. Uh, you might have a library, that would be quite nice. Uh, you might have some, some hydroponics going on in the, in the roof, various things. Uh, you, could, uh, 
Is that a euphemism? <laughs> right. Uh, and you could, of course, uh, collectivise the gardens uh, a lot. Which, uh, But uh, if you actually look at what's happened since then, these ideas have not taken off. It's quite clear they've not taken off. The, that the general feeling of privacy and sort of nuclear fa family, yes, please, is much more, you know, we, we, we sort of learn a lot about, sort of in the sense, uh, uh, certain... Uh, unarguable things about uh, the way humans prefer to, to live their lives. You say you must mention stosis treatment. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, yes, I, I, I have. Sorry, sorry, I've just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Um, sorry. We, what? We're, we're nearing the end of I'm nearing the end of my time. Good. Uh, that's fine. Yeah, so, <laughs> but what Godfrey is saying is that this, in some sense, was realised in Milton Keynes, where you actually had two uh, parallel rows of terraces like this. And, and uh, this was very much in everybody's mind. Now, they didn't actually go that far or do lots of the things, but some of the things that are there in the book were realised in, in this double row at Spencer Street, particularly blocking off the ends of the street, that's an obvious thing to do. <coughs> then you've got um, a sort of pedestrianised zone for kids to play in and things to muck about, and then you've got all these greenhouses and all sorts of things. But I think I can notice several uh, former residents of uh, uh, Spencer Street here. Uh, who will who no doubt talk about it if they want to. So uh, that, was a, that was a really interesting idea. So some of the, these ideas still have traction and could still work. Lots of these uh, ideas about sort of joining up to things like this and you know, having a greenhouse. I think a lot of us have actually done that. Uh, right, um, next one. Um, uh, the, the, however, uh, there were critics of this kind of autonomy and it, Cliff Harper himself was one of them, and this is the cover of, of uh, architectural design that he did. So he's got this, unfortunately, it's, it's a bit too close, you can't see it. It says, on here it says, autonomous property, keep out. <laughs> <laughs> and there are these two rather sour. This one obviously modelled on Mary Whitehouse. <laughs> I think. Um, okay, so, okay, nice idyllic scene, and then at the back, <coughs> the dark satanic mirrors that lie behind every scene. So that's, you know, you know, you cannot have this without that. And that's one of the things we realize, yes, you've got to think about the cities. That's a very important thing. Uh, one more, um, uh, yeah. So this is in answer to this question about whether we're going to do it with, for everybody or we can do it a bit ourselves. This is my model of how society works. It's funny. Uh, like a, a Victorian bookend, uh, this technique of marbling where you have lots of colors oil and water and you swing them about. Uh, the colours are everywhere. Every colour is everywhere, but doesn't mix with any other colour. And that's the way we tend to operate rather unconsciously in society. So if you're, a, a say, a red person, as some of us doubtless are, uh, you could be everywhere, all over. You'll find red people everywhere. And you don't realise that you're walking through and past all the white people and the green people and all the other people. They're not they are people. You, you, you know, buy things off them, you do, you know, you do, but you don't invite them to tea. You don't sort of go down the pub with them. They're not, they're not, you live in your own little bit, your own little community, and, and, and you, you can really create the illusion that pretty well everybody's like that, you know, things like that, outside. So, um, what I'm saying here is, is that that's something I think that's unconsciously happened to us over the years, and, uh, and that's a question I'm asking. If we manage to fill uh, one of these sections, let's say, fill all the reds, then go green, radical technology, adopt all these ideas, can we just carry on living nice, groovy, convivial, uh, sustainable lives, irrespective of what everybody else does? Or do we have to take everybody else with us? That's the question. All right, thank you very much. Uh, right, now I would like to ask Herbie. Thank you, Peter. To, uh, thank you very much. And uh, by the way, I'm one of the aboriginals, like Peter, like Godfrey. I was heavily involved in the early days of Undercurrents, but also Resurgence magazine. And I've got a little section in the Radical Technology book, which is about new villages, actually. Uh, and in fact, it looks rather like frog spawn. There's lots of little round sort of bubbles with little houses inside, and there are circular houses. I was really interested in the idea of can we get back to building round houses? rather than square houses, because, I mean, I studied anthropology and most 
people in traditional society, many, many people live in circular houses. I thought that was quite a idea. Also, I'd worked in the Roundhouse in London, and that was another inspiration for that sort of idea. So I'm, I'm um, not only Aboriginal, also rather schizophrenic in a sense, not medically, I don't think, but, but in the sense that I'm on the one hand, I love London particularly, but big cities fascinate me. On the other hand, I live in a, in a village in, in, in Wandershire. And so when we did, uh, well, when you did Radical Technology, I also did a little book called Land for the People. And the idea of that book was basically, Britain had reached the point where there was, in my view, and still is today, in fact even more so today than then, a massive imbalance between city and country. When you look at the numbers of people still working the land, it's around 1% of the population. And, you know, when, when, when my wife and I first moved to Monmouthshire, and the guy who runs the local tractor company, you know, a sales operation, were little Fergie tractors, 20 horsepower, 30 horsepower, maybe 35. Now there are 400 horsepower, massive machines, enormous technology that makes farming possible. So the imbalance between rural and urban has grown greater than it ever has. So I think the idea, and in this book the idea was, okay, you know, the city is great, and I've been working in Notting Hill, been helping to run the Notting Hill Carnival and all this kind of stuff, and we've been occupying buying buildings and turning them into community centers and to communes and so on. So that was all very exciting. But at the same time, in the mid-70s, we were reaching the point and saying, well, can this city really continue to exist with this extraordinary dependence on oil and gas and coal and food from somewhere around the world and resources of all kinds flashing into the city and somehow making you know, a highly dependent urban lifestyle possible. So in the 70s we were thinking, and this book came out by the way, the same year as Radical Technology, <coughs> can we build new communities? Now at that time, Finton had just started and there was Longo mine in Switzerland, in Austria, and in, in France. And there was the farm in America. And so there was the idea of building communes. No longer communes in one house, but communes as communities uh, in separate buildings uh, with people. Some of them nuclear, some of them not so nuclear, with a lot of intermingling and sleeping <coughs> together and all this kind of stuff going on. So that was kind of the vision at that time. And when I said to my wife, I would like to move into a commune, she said, no, without me. I'm not going to come with you, sorry, Herbie. So, we instead, we moved on to a small holding, we managed to find sort of money to kind of scrape together to kind of move on to a small holding. So we are now part of a village, but not part of a com commune, sort of thing. And so, certainly, the idea of building new villages at that time really was, you could maybe buy larger farms, groups of people together, and then build new settlements around the existing farm buildings and then people would partly live on their own and partly farm the land together. And so certainly that is a region that is still around very much at this moment in time. But the reality and what, and what this book completely ignored was the fact that the main problem was not actually ownership of land but planning permission. You can't simply go into South Wales or into Norfolk or into Gloucestershire and move on to a farm as a group of people and simply plonk houses down around the farm buildings. You simply won't get the permission. And that in some ways is a good thing because obviously that would mean the scattering of people uh, in low density ways potentially into rural areas. And so certainly our planning laws in Britain forbid that. And so certainly the reality is today that most new communities have been built in cities, for instance, Bennington Zero Energy Development, which is not dissimilar to your slide from Clifford Harper there. That is in South London, that is uh, as part, part of the city. And so certainly we are seeing quite a bit of that sort of development taking place in urban areas. Uh, whereas in rural areas, there have been, for instance, in the village where I live, there's a lot of people who've moved in from London, who've taken over bits of land and extended houses and somehow managed to make a go of a, of a rural lifestyle, but still dependent on the motor car, because if you are not right next to a train line or a, or a bus, bus, you have a bus link close by, it's very, very hard then not to rely on the motor car. So we are, on the one hand, living rural lifestyles, on the other hand, we are still heavily dependent on fossil fuel technology. So Peter's point on cities as 
potentially sustainable places because density plays a major role in the, in, the, in the linkages between people. You know, we are all close together. We don't, in London, people have far <coughs> lower per capita land, uh, car ownership than in than rural areas, for instance. But then when you look at developing countries, and this is one that has been my work uh, in many ways for the last uh, 40 years or so, trying to get to grips with the fact that we live in an urbanizing world. And when you look at China or India, typically a person moving from a village to a city will increase their resource consumption per person, per capita, fourfold. So you have a massive, massive increase in the use of resources as people become urban citizens. So it's true to say that in uh, Britain today, urban living is in, in some ways more efficient than rural living. And rural people still go to supermarkets like Tesco's or, or Waitrose or Lidl or whatever it happens to be. But by and large, you know, rural living in the way we tend to do today is slightly less efficient, particularly transport-wise. Also, it's typically detached houses rather than terrace houses, no sharing of party walls and that kind of stuff. So the reality, however, worldwide is that urbanization means wrecking global ecosystems in the most extraordinary ways. I spent quite a lot of time as a filmmaker in far-flung places like the Amazon and so on. I remember one day uh, filming in the port of Belém and there was this freighter being loaded with, with, with mahogany and it said London on it. You know, so London demands resources <coughs> from the Amazon. And it may want soya beans from, from, from Mato Grosso in Brazil. It wants palm oil from the former rainforest areas in Malaysia and Indonesia and so on. And so we do this anyway, but if you have China with 1.3 million people in India with similar figures all wanting to follow our patterns of urbanization, the ecological impacts are simply disastrous. So the question is, what do we do about this? Urbanization can't easily be, easily be stopped because people want better lifestyles. And it is certainly true to say that in countries like China, urbanization has contributed to uh, increases uh, of reductions in poverty, no doubt about it. Uh, so poverty reduction in China has been massive, directly linked to industrialization and that directly linked to urbanization. So we are facing a hugely problematic situation. Now, in terms of solutions to this problem, I mean, I've personally been involved. I was working in Adelaide, Australia uh, 13 years ago, where we have a low-density city, some, like a sort of mini LA, but just 1.3 million people. And it was massively unsustainable with the capita carbon footprints of about 22 tons per person, very high, nearly twice as much as here, partly because of air conditioning, partly because of, uh, you know, commuting and so on. So I was given the task together with others to try and rethink that urban area from a sustainability perspective. And the good news today is that you can read this up in various places on the internet. It is now the highest percentage of renewable energy, wind, wind power and solar, anywhere in the world, 45% wind and solar electricity, simply by introducing the right kind of legislation. Feeder tariffs, we managed to introduce feeder tariffs in South Australia. Water efficiency, uh, insulating buildings, retrofitting buildings. Uh, and many, that are, and yeah, 100% organic waste recycling, returning all the organic waste from the city back to the hinterland and irrigating the local farmland with recycled sewage. So you can do these things, but then ultimately to get to grips with this highly unsustainable urbanizing world that we are heading towards, we need a profound retrofit of both existing cities and the design of new cities that operate quite differently, not in a linear, but in a circular way in terms of how natural systems function. Nature doesn't just take, nature always gives back. And that is the critical difference between the way we operate in our urban industrial civilization and the way uh, in which uh, our modern cities operate. Taking food, taking timber, taking metals, taking all fossil fuel from somewhere and giving nothing back to nature other than pollution. So this is the predicament that we really have to face up to. And all of this thinking uh, started in books like Radical Technology and, and other similar books that came out at the time, and magazines like Undercurrents of Resurgence and so on. And so I've been involved in this process and I'm still at it, as it were, but I'm sort of partly 
optimistic because there are some good examples. Copenhagen, the Danish, and we will hear from Preben uh, this evening. Uh, Denmark has done a remarkable job of not only retrofitting its na national energy system towards renewables, but also sitting its prem uh, uh, retrofitting its premier city, Copenhagen, into a remarkably uh, sustainable organism. And so I'm sure you will refer to that in your talk today. And I'm really excited to have read up about this. And so really, it's a very, very critical issue now to face up to the fact that we live in an urbanizing world, that we have Arcadian ideas, but these are not necessarily going to be the leading ideas in terms of the global trends. And we need to really get to grips with how we can make an urbanizing world that doesn't wreck the planet at the same time. Thank you. That. So, that, have you alluded to the fact that this evening we have a special session uh, on community energy, uh, and among the speakers will be our guest, Bevan Nagel from, from Denmark. Um, okay, uh, Chas, may I ask you to uh, say a few words? Okay, thank you. I'm, um, I'm from urban West Yorkshire, and um, a lot of the things that, that sort of influence me are, are, the, are the issues that affect core cities like Manchester, Leeds, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Bristol. Um, I, I'm a member of the board of the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership, um, which is a sort of industry government partnership. So I do sit in the same room from time to time as the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders. So some of what I'm going to talk about is actually influenced by the realities uh, that we're dealing with today and, uh, you know, influenced by the past. Um, I'm a sort of graduate of, um, in 1972, or 74, of the Community Action and Environment Unit of the NUS. Um, but I wasn't an environmentalist, I was more about community action. But I did move on to my one involvement with Peter and Godfrey as the distributor of undercurrents, um, because I was one of the founders of PDC that Martin mentioned earlier, P Publications Distribution Corp, which um, made some contribution to mainstreaming radical and feminist ideas. But more recently, and the reason I'm standing up here, I, I guess, is because I was the founder of City Car Club, which was originally called Smart Moves, and had its first operations in Bristol in, in 2000. And I want to talk about the sort of the interesting things post-internet, um, that the shared use of a pool of vehicles, um, which we in Britain call car clubs, but everywhere else in the world they call car sharing, so if I talk about car sharing I do not mean lift sharing, I mean sharing a pool of cars. And I think in, for the way we look at it today, there's a, an interesting synergy with other shared transport, a public transport, and certainly in those early days we had a vision of a, of a less car use in society, but uh, you know, as you, many of you will see, we have something like 23 million vehicles in Britain, and it, apparently inexorable growth of vehicle ownership. Um, but I just want to—I want to sort of try and relate very briefly how I think the experience we've had with shared-use vehicles and shared-use bikes at more recently has a relevance to the current debate about autonomous and connected vehicles if they are used for collective mobility services rather than for individual Google-type cars that were just, you know, for the rich and powerful. Um, and I think there's a real connection between the issues of um, data and communications that was the theme of the last session, creating the potential for behaviour change, and that in some ways we miss the point if we always talk about fuel types, because fuel types on their own are not uh, going to address the issues of either carbon reduction or air quality that so uh, beset um, the, challenge, uh, the issues of Manchester and Leeds and Bristol. Um, now back in 1995, uh, I was inspired, as some other people were, by what was happening in Switzerland with mobility, uh, the creation of a cooperative to share vehicles. Uh, actually, it started with sharing boats, but I mean, that's, a, that's way back in history. But, I mean, my take on what we did, we started with a community scheme in the late 90s, which became a commercial, I was the founder of the first commercial operation of car clubs in Britain, um, which was sort of incubated at, at Coventry University. But it was all pre, sorry, it was all at a time when the internet penetration was very low, and some of the interesting things that have happened uh, happen a because the internet is now more 
uh, ubiquitous. Even people over 60 now seem to know how to use the internet, so can join car clubs. So back in um, back in the uh, back in the 2000, it was really difficult to, to sell these concepts to people in um, in uh, the later years because they did, they didn't actually know how to book the cars because they didn't know how to use the internet. Now that's much less of a problem. Um, but I mean, I think um, we developed what's happened in Britain, which, which um, is increasingly um, something that's largely now uh, the purview of bigger corporations, uh, car ship, uh, owned by rental car companies and, and um, car manufacturers. But, but we started this whole process by looking at what was happening in Switzerland, Germany, uh, companies like Statmobile and Cambio in Germany, Mobility Car Sharing in Austria, Communauto, the, the real pioneers in Montreal that people often in Europe forget about. Um, and I think what's been really interesting is looking at the cities where the take-up has been most significant. Because it is a bit about demographics and it is a bit about um, uh, good partners. And, and by far the, the, the most um, interesting place to look at, from my point of view, is Edinburgh. Because in Edinburgh, um, not only was there some interesting pioneering of the whole concept of car clubs and the councillors and MPs used them, and they gradually sort of dissipated around the whole city. So there are, you know, there are now um, um, hundreds rather than dozens of cars. Um, but it's also built into the planning process. So the, co the concept of low car and and uh, car free housing requires some sense of reducing the amount that people can own cars and you have to provide the car as one of a suite of options that people can have access to and that we, we got Edinburgh City Council to take on board this as part of the planning process in 2004 and a few London boroughs did the same and Bristol did the same but it, it's, a, it's, it's still not the norm um, but it is uh, I think an important way of planning for the longer term um, but I mean I think this um, this has sort of manifested itself now into, um, I, I, work, I worked for City Car Club, learned a lot about working as a partner of Brighton and Hove Council or Hackney Council or whatever, and we, and we sort of sensed that um, gradually the technology was getting better and the customer service was better. We were, in a sense, benefiting from the use of te telemetry, telematics that was the, the best use of telecommunications and internet technology in the cars to allow them to be self-service. And the real forcing ground for all this it was really Germany, where it's a much bigger market, and Switzerland, where it is one big co-op that sort of works with uh, Swiss Rail. And so we haven't developed any of the technology in Britain, really. I mean, we re the company, I have an interest in the company that resells it. Um, but it's very much uh, uh, something that um, all, all the leading edge stuff is in, um, is, is in mainland Europe and to a certain extent in North America. But I think if we see, what's, if we see what the connection is today, I mean, I think the, the really interest for a lot of people is where is this debate on connected and um, autonomous vehicles going? And there is, I think, a real connection between shared transport that I've been involved in and the future of connected and autonomous vehicles. And the connection I see first and foremost is the, the real fear in public transport that Uber and Uberization of our cities will actually diminish the, 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 the interest in public transport. And the response to that, is, is, apart from a lot of public transport operators absolutely shit scared of, the, of their future market, is, is the development of this concept of mobility as a service, which predicates the, the argument that with the technology we've got, that people will increasingly be non-car owners but will use the car from time to time and be good customers for public transport, shared bikes, um, working at home, all that, all, all those uh, connectivity issues. And where mobility as a service is, 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 is most interesting is where it's an open source approach to cities that everybody can use rather than controlled by Siemens or Xerox or Daimler who would like to control what happens in cities. So we have a real paradox here, where um, we have the potential, but it could be uh, overtaken by the, 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 the strength of big corporations to want the data and to want the, to control the communications and to charge us for the privilege. And I think um, the, the, the most interesting stuff, if you want to see what it looks like, starts in Helsinki, where in order to, in order to, in order to maintain 
for public transport. It has to be more flexible, it has to be as cheap as Uber, and it has to, it has to sort of aggregate people in an effective way to provide a decent service. And if we can sort of try and recognise that that's sort of the future for cities allowing people not to own cars, not to pollute, um, we need to look at this mobility as a service concept. Uh, as a way of integrating different forms of transport, the shared car and the shared bike are just one part of a, frag of a, 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 a fractional uh, user who also uses trams and buses, trains and ferries. Um, the, the interesting thing from a point of view of sitting on the Low Carbon Vehicle Partnership is that um, the struggle to sort of really be a big player in this world, surprisingly, uh, has included um, the companies like BMW, who have Drive Now, Daimler, who have Thank You Car to Go, um, and some of the things that the, the bigger companies that are actually delivering are really interesting. I mean, the, the, the ability um, of people who are um, to, to use one-way car sharing, um, to um, have apps that tell you where the parking is free. I mean, I wasn't not some of the fascinating stuff that particularly um, uh, Daimler and and and. Um, and uh, and the, the, the whole OEM sector is really trying to make sense of, con of, the, of the potential of connected vehicles. I just hope that when we look at this more closely, we can ensure that the connected and autonomous vehicles are used in the way that they already are in some ways with doctrines like railways and, and stuff at airports for the collective good rather than for selling us more individualistic solutions that I'm sure Google would prefer us to to, to do. So just to finish on one note then, who is still operational in this sector, in the UK, that's not part of a for-profit big corporation being t taken over by the rental sector and the OEMs? Well, some of you will know the answer to this. There are two answers. There's CoWheels, which is um, a not-for-profit community enterprise that runs cars in Bristol, runs cars all over Britain from um, Aberdeen southwards if you like, and CoCars which is based in Exeter, which is cooperative, which both of which I think need, we, we, need, we need to recognise that the, the not-for-profit and the co-op have a very different take on how this is all going. And lastly of course there are some very micro businesses in Pembrokeshire, Llanid Lewis, Forest that are independent car clubs that just serve individual communities. So I mean I would I would just finish off by saying I think this has an incredibly important bearing not only to high density housing, which um, Lord Rogers, who's, who I heard speak at the um, the planning summit this year, talked about how if we're going to grow our cities, we must grow them from communities with higher densities, with high quality housing. And to do that, we must fix the transport challenge. We can't just do it in the absence of it. And so I never really read this book you're talking about, because it didn't say much about transport. <laughs> Thank you very much, yes. And Hugh, if you care to take the lecture. Yeah. Well, I'm wearing this T-shirt because I thought it was highly relevant to the original message that you mentioned earlier about no transport. Well, I suppose no transport actually means trans not using mechanical transport except for a bike. So I hope you appreciate the, the slight underdress that I've... Um, I, I, was, I went to the loo, as one does, um, at coffee time, and um, was startled by the purity, the unsullied nature of the walls of the cubicle I happen to be in. I won't go into any, you know, no further. But uh, they, they, they totally lacked any graffiti. And it occurred to me, when well, back in those halcyon days of the 70s, the, uh, the loos, wherever one went in a student area, or even the sort of just a youngish kind of area, were beautifully decorated. Sometimes not so elegantly, one has to say, um, perhaps a, a, a bit beyond the pale, but nevertheless, there was, there was, there was a marvellous invention. And I think that's something about the period that we were living in. So while now it's probably quite difficult to write on those, those new walls. Um, so there's a technological advance which has happened. I don't know if any of you have tried recently. <laughs> but um, 
but uh, th there was this kind of inventiveness, an originality, a creativity there, which I don't experience in society now. It may simply be my age, and you know, I don't see it. I'm not experiencing it. The creativity may be in IT and spheres like that, but not in terms of the ideas of how we live, what we need to do, how we might organise ourselves. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, I think that's, that's true. Students also in those days, and even in the 80s, 90s, were lot stronger, more, in, more challenging, more um, again the gas kind of thing. Now they just so they, they assume that you know exactly what you're talking about <laughs> and, um, and, just, and just listen to you. So I know there's a, ch a change uh, in things. Um, now I, I do happen to have one of the original books. Not quite sure when I bought it. Of course, I didn't actually read it um, because there's all sorts of words with a very small typeface there. But I did look at the pictures, and I have to admit this. And um, the picture of the terrace, which Peter showed earlier, was highly influential in, in my development and what I thought I ought to be doing. And I'd also been to CAT, Centre for Alternative Technology, in Mukunkli. And those two things inspired me to be one of the originators of what we call the Urban Centre for Appropriate Technology, which started off in Bristol, the original idea at least, in the 79. Um, so that terrace, I thought, that's not a rural terrace, it's not a rural Arcadian image, it's an urban image. And yet all this talk, all the um, the images which are being created, or all the sort of motivation which people seem to have in thinking about AT, as was another term, IT, AT, um, was, was about a rural idyll. And I do think that the radical technology revisiting it now, inspiring as it was then, now rereading bits of it yesterday, it's got this kind of naive belief that technology has the answer. And an almost millenarian, can I say that word, millenarian belief that society will reorganize itself progressively along the lines that we dreamt of. Um, communal living, you know, the end of the family and all this kind of thing. There's a kind of huge naivety there of people who hadn't yet founded their own families and therefore didn't appreciate, maybe, what was going on and what, what would really drive them in the longer run. Uh, the motivation was very strong in relation to resources and, and uh, um, social development, social cohesion and all those kind of things. Very, very, very admirable. But uh, the, the naivety sort of uh, meant that its, its time has gone and now we need a new, new vision, as indeed um, we were talking about earlier, Herbie was talking about. Um, so, the, the background, uh, which you mentioned, I'm, fin I'm finding that I'm repeating things which have been said already, but Morris's News from Nowhere, and also the Blueprint for Survival, were highly influential documents uh, in, in that period, um, and, and helped to shape the images people had. So, with the benefit of hindsight, what do I feel now? Well, in the Urban Centre for Appropriate Technology, what we tried to do was relate the ideas of AT, alternative technology, to the urban setting, and really try and reinterpret so that the places where most people live in Britain, it's now 80%, or if you look at, it, look at their lifestyles, it's more like 95% of people who are really urban, even if they live in rural areas. Mm. They are urban. They're just dispar sometimes disconnected, mm -hmm. like little, little sort of um, co colonies of the city in a separate area, using very heavy levels of, of transport to get around. But so what can we do within the city? So that was what the urban centre was trying to achieve. 
um, mimicking on a very small scale what the Alternative Technology Centre had done in Flintley. And um, we didn't quite do what we wanted to do then. It ended up as the Bristol Energy Centre and is now, I don't know if anyone here is from it, the Centre for, for, Centre for Sustainable Energy in Bristol, which is internationally, nationally and internationally known. I've got nothing to do with it now, but it, it's, uh, it's a freestanding charity uh, providing huge incentives for tackling fuel poverty and reducing energy use um, in cities and, and towns. So that's, that's what happened to it. Um, so coming back to this sort of the benefit of hindsight, why was it that that image which we had of, of the rural idyll failed or was not possible to interpret? Well, I look at one example of that rural idyll from the turn of last century called White Way in Gloucestershire. Yes. And it, it was founded as a communal development of housing in a rural area with big gardens where people could grow their own food with a local school, a uh, small school, and, um, and bakery and, and little shop and so on. Um, people trying to live an independent life in a rural setting, as indeed then happened in eco-villages of a later era. But what happened to it now? Well, first of all, you have to be very rich to buy a house there, because it's, it's of course, living. It's in the middle of the countryside, beautiful environment, privileged enclave of people. Um, so you have to be rich. You also need to have one car per adult, and immediately your teenagers reach the age when they can drive, they have to have a car too, because there's nothing there. This image of rural um, environmentalism is a false one. I remember arguing this through with, maybe some people may know, Richard St. George, who unfortunately died, who was director of the Schumacher Society for many years. Uh, he was always preaching this particular idea. And I was saying, no, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, look what happens. If you look at the research now, the level of energy consumption of people who live in villages is about three times that of people who live in inner urban areas. Their carbon footprint, their ecological footprint, is, bears no comparison. So, now, this is putting you on the spot. How many people here consider that they live in a relatively rural spot where basically most trips have to be taken by car? And we're the environmentalists. <coughs> So the way the market is working, the way our personal preferences are working, means that we're still promoting an unsustainable pattern. Thank you. Um, so to try and and, and analyse the reasons why in some countries they seem to have made much bigger steps towards a sustainable pattern of settlement than we have in this country. And uh, Copenhagen, Denmark has mentioned, that's a very good example. You might be looking at, at what they've achieved in Holland or in some cities like Freiburg in Germany. Um, what, is it that they, what is it that's different between what we can do here, let alone in America, and or Australia, and what they've managed to achieve in order to create the opportunity, not necessarily the achievement, the opportunity for greater uh, environmental sustainability. And it basically comes down, I will say, to two things, and we'll be discussing these, no doubt, tomorrow in the afternoon when we look at settlements. The first is who controls land? Who owns land? If you look at new housing, for example, in this, in this country, almost all the potential housing land allocated through the planning system is bought up by some, a few big firms who control the system. If you look at many rural areas, you find that there are huge areas owned by only a few people. Think back, of course, to the changes in Scotland a few centuries ago. 
So land and who controls it, who manages the development process, is critical. Um, a second factor is the level of influence which the municipality, the local authority, has over the future. In this country, we've disenfranchised local government. Local government is almost powerless unless you're the London mayor, maybe. It's just fulfilling the remit which governments give it. And then governments say, well, we haven't got quite the money, so you'll have to fulfill the remit even though you can't. It's a disastrous system. What you look, see on the continent, where, these, where better places have been achieved, and are being achieved now, is that the city has a, a, a significant degree of, use the word, autonomy, financially, and in planning development terms. That's what we need to get to here. So I think that's my minute. Thank you very much, Hugh. Um, could I once again invite Rob to make a few comments? This is a funny kind of role, I've not really done this before. <laughs> um, uh, I was very lucky that the, the course that I did here in Bristol at UWE that, that, that Hugh coordinated and was one of my teachers on, when I left that, the thing that really inspired me was the whole idea of eco-villages and the, 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 the push in, in the permaculture books about the most ethical thing to do is to get a piece of land, build your own house, uh, grow your own fuel, grow your own food, all that kind of stuff that, that Peter talked about. And I did that for, for a number of years. I moved to Ireland. My life has been punctuated with periods of leaving this country in great disgust and then sort of coming back a few years later. And, um, uh, and we got to a stage where we were building a house, we were growing food, all of that stuff in place. And I remember having my kind of climate change dark night of the soul and feeling like, what's the point of doing this if I'm not prepared to defend this? Am I prepared to defend this against people who are hungry and would like what's in my garden? Am I prepared to defend it against people who are cold and would like my firewood? And actually, how, how healthy and how socially divisive is, is that as an approach? So actually, one of the things that really underpinned the beginning of the transition movement was that sense of this has to be something that works for everybody, that is an invitation to everybody, or, 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 or it's really not worth doing. And um, that thing of learning to work with people, with, one of the things with the eco-village movement was you kind of chose to live with people who were kind of like you. And actually it's not really a luxury, if it is a, even a luxury, I would question whether it's even a luxury, to actually be able to do that. And the big challenge for me is about how we learn to live with the people that we live with. And how we learn to work with, the, with, with, with people in different ways. And actually one of the things for me, we have a conference called Radical Technology that's missing, and that's missing going through everything that's going to be coming up over the next few days, is the kind of social technology side of it. You know, in permaculture there was this thing about earth care, people care, fair shares. Permaculture is great at the earth care bit, but that's the easy bit. Actually, you know, creating, creating the kind of stuff we need, that's really the easy bit. How we get people to work together without killing each other or suing each other, that's the really tough bit. And actually, you know, and, and, I, and you know, being here with some of the kind of veterans of, uh, of this movement, I mean, the question I would really put is how many people who've been doing this for, for the length of time you have have experienced some form of burnout. You put your hand up if during your time being involved in this kind of work you've had some period of exhaustion, of burnout. Yeah. And I'd say there's quite a few people who are here, who, who aren't here, who aren't here because they came into this movement and I'm sure there are many people you can think of who fell by the wayside during this movement. What's the point of a movement that is trying to create a new paradigm and a new way of doing things if we don't nurture the people so we can actually sustain our energy through that. If, we, if we're working together as groups, we need to have those social technologies that look after our personal resilience, our group resilience, that we learn those skills and those abilities. Those are one of some of the most radical technologies, uh, I would argue. And I was really inspired by uh, something I saw Brian Eno, a talk he gave recently, where he said, we need to move away from talking about genius. 
this idea that uh, Picasso or Captain Beefheart were geniuses just sort of in their own right. They emerged and they were just a genius. Actually, all around them were people who enabled them to be a genius, who inspired them, who supported them. And actually, the ideas that we see happening uh, at the community scale all over the place, uh, the, the really meaningful stuff comes from communities, comes from people learning to work together and actually make that stuff happen. A while ago in Canada, there's some research happening in Canada into transition that's happened over the last three years. Very deep research with all the Canadian transition groups. One of the findings they had was that the majority of these uh, tended to happen in kind of conservative uh, places, in conservative communities. And the researchers' theory was this was because if you live in a, a conservative community and you're kind of a bit radical and a bit different, you just seek out all the kind of all, all the sort of progressive people and you all hang together and call yourself a transition town. And actually, and I, but actually that's not my experience, that actually one of the, the, the things we see is a lot of transition groups happen in those places because it, it appeals to those people too. I go to quite a few transition groups, they could also be the kind of people who might start the Rotary Club, but they're inspired by the idea of making their place more resilient, looking at food in a different way, looking at energy in a different way, and actually finding those ways to, to reach into people who aren't like us I think are really, really important. So I just wanted to st just a few stories of that from, from transition. Uh, transition tooting in London, when we look at the cities, the way that the transition groups work is at the neighbourhood scale. <clears throat> at a scale where you can bring people together and you, and you can make stuff happen. It's not about a kind of an Arcadian idea, it's about saying we're in the cities already, but how can we find human scale <clears throat> within those neighbourhoods and within those places. Tooting, if you take a walk down Tooting High Street, all the food in those shops going down the high street is imported mostly en masse from the Indian subcontinent. What does local food mean in that context? Transition tooting do a thing called the food eval every year, where they grow food on balconies, on allotments, uh, all over the place. They even have an allotment where they grow wheat, uh, and then they bring it all down to Tooting High Street, uh, it was a couple of weeks ago, and the chefs from all the different traditions, Turkish, Lebanese, Pakistani, come out and they cook that local food in their tradition, and it's distributed uh, and raises thinking about what local food means. Uh, in uh, near Wigan, there's a project called Green Slate Farm, where the community took into community ownership, and this thing of communities owning assets is a really, really important part of this, I think. They took an old uh, farm that was owned by the council into community ownership. They run it as a care farm. It's in community ownership, but it picks up many of the roles and the services that were run by the local council and are all being dropped through austerity, but it's run in, in, in a way on behalf of the community. In Fishguard, uh, they started a, a surplus food cafe where they were aware of all the food that was being thrown away on a daily basis and they set up a cafe to turn that into affordable meals to train young people who want a future in catering where there's no opportunities for them uh, <coughs> and, and things like that. The one that I really love is, um, oh, so we, we found recently looking around, that, oh, just looking at seven community energy projects coming through transition groups, about £13 million pounds worth of <coughs> communities investing into themselves. You know, this idea of trying to meet needs in a way that you don't have to buy into the bigger kind of idea necessarily, looking at investing in different ways, seeing your community get better, doing care, managing care in different ways. But actually often we get fixated in our culture on looking at the biggest, most impressive things, like the Bristol Pound or the, 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 the very big things. I love, I tend to love the smaller stories. And one of my favorite ones was in, in Kensal and in Kilburn in London, transitioned Kensal to Kilburn. There was a guy who was involved in that project and uh, he'd been, he'd, he, was, he, was very, he worked as a sustainability consultant and he spent all of his time dashing around all over the place. And he realised he didn't really know where he was, uh, know the place where he lived. And uh, he read a story about a woman in Bournemouth who died in her flat and wasn't found for about six years. And he thought, if I died on my street, would anybody even notice? Do I even know anybody on my street? And then around that time, he, 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 he uh, tore a tendon in his leg and he was on crutches for a month and he couldn't go dashing around all over the place. So he just had to hobble around the place where he was. And he noticed there were lots of people growing grapes. And he started to hatch this mad idea of what would it look like if we made a Kensal wine? What would that be like? And so he called, this, he called it the Unthinkable Drinkable Project. <laughs> and, he, uh, and while he was hobbling in the park, he met an elderly Italian gentleman in his 70s and just on a whim, he went up to him and said, do you know how to make wine? And he said, my friend, the soles of my feet are still purple. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> from, from, from treading wine every year until I was 29 when I moved here. So he said, great, great, we need you, that's fantastic. So they went and they picked all the grapes they could find and they bought some grapes in the market and then they set up a, whatever you call it, like a treading pit, I don't know, there's probably a proper French word for it, in the street. They shut the street off, they had a, a wine pressing day, all the people in the street came out, they all got to meet their neighbours. The wine is absolutely disgusting. <laughs> But that's really not the point. It's really not the point. They call it. Un they call but the it point is that the section on food is this afternoon. And you haven't mentioned the word mobility once. <laughs> so does transition have any answers to mobility? The uh, one of the things because I don't feel this is you're on the point personally. Okay. Well, I apologise for that. Um, one of the uh, projects in. Um, uh, in, in, in Scotland, Transition Black Isle in Scotland did a project called the Million Mile Project where they set out to reduce uh, car use there which is, which is very high because they're a peninsula and they have lots of commuting and uh, so, that, so they, that, that they ran it from the community up in a way that couldn't be done from the top and their aim was to reduce travel by a million miles in the end they reduced it by 1.3 million miles they increased walking by 74,000 kilometres or something, cycling by 130 and because they're working at that scale, lots of transition groups do uh, um, cycling things, training people up how to use cycling. There are car clubs that have been established through, through transition groups. So there are uh, a lot of projects that come through transition around transport. They tend to be, they tend to find that transport is something that's harder to do as a community because it's affected by bigger things that, that, that come from outside. But certainly, uh, for example, we had a project called Transition Streets that we started uh, in Tottenham as a thing that looked at behaviour change and said, if we want to help people in the places where we live reduce energy use, reduce water use, how, how do we do that? So it was designed with the idea, a bit like Global Action Plan, where you meet in each other's houses seven times and so on, um, and you look at different things every week. On average, it led to about 1.3 tonnes of carbon uh, saving in each household. Um, there were car clubs that were set up, there were car share things, there was an electric bike scheme we then got funded where every street then took on an electric bike and had a rotor for how that was looked after. Um, but actually the key thing that then when people were surveyed afterwards and there was intensive uh, research that was done after that that came out of it was that what people wanted was, well, what people got out of it was knowing their neighbours better and feeling a better part of the community where they were. And the thing that I mentioned in the previous session that I'm involved with uh, in my town of Tottenham, which is Atmos Tottenham, uh, which is a community-led uh, re regeneration project, 60-something affordable homes, using a community right to build order, which is a power in the localism act that says if you can show that you've engaged extensively and you've designed something, then the planning is decided by referendum. So if more than 50% of the people who vote vote yes, then that's a planning uh, consent. That's designed to be radically low carbon, uh, radically low car with, a, with an electric car pool, uh, cycling next to the railway station. So yeah, it's very much foremost in, in, in the thinking of a lot of a lot of transition groups. One of the things about transition is it invites people to come forward with what they're passionate about. So if a lot of people care about food, that's what you get in places where there are people who are very passionate about transport. You get some really great uh, transport schemes. Thank, Thank you. you.